Okay, so the winner, let's let's count these up. So I've got six votes for Vermel Houghton and seven votes for Borhavia and seven. I was really hoping someone would pick the Flavins, but you losers did no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think the winner is going to be um the Borhavia N seven. That seemed fair? I didn't vote by the way, I swear. I did bias the vote by writing a description. This molecule is totally stupid. If you vote for it, you're stupid. Anyone want to vote for this molecule? <laughs> uh, okay, so here's your assignment then. Your assignment is to design a total synthesis of... I'm going to let you design for either one, Vermelhotten or Borhavia. And I will post this um, document so that you can see it. Well, I'll post an announcement that's a little bit more concise so you can see those two molecules. And I'll let you pick whichever one you want. Okay. Now that I've said that, I'm going to teach you how to design a total synthesis using a technique that we professionals use that makes it so you don't have to memorize every single reaction on Earth and be just amazing. Thanks to the, <laughs> the advent of modern technology, you don't have to be, you don't have to know everything and still be a good organic chemist. So here's how it works. You go to the USU library homepage, and all of this that I'm saying right now, I'm recording, and I'm going to post this recording on Canvas. You go over here to this link called Articles and Databases to the left. Click on it. You go down here to Science, you go to Chemistry and Biochemistry and click on that. Then you'll find this link <clears throat> to this thing called SciFinder. You click on that. It will ask you if you're at a non-USU network computer or if you're not on USU network. I'm on the wireless right now. And if you, once you log in for the first, I'm logging into the wireless, I think, for the first time for this software today, to type in your A numbered password. And once you're, you do that, then you can access this uh, anywhere. Okay, um, if you don't have a username or password, which none of you do, I assume, you have to set one up and it's free. Okay. I do, so I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And then it will welcome you to this software database called SciFinder Scholar. So anyway, um, here's the deal. You come to this home page. There's so many cool things you can do with this database. And we professional chemists use it all the time. If, for example, you want to look up a compound by its name, you can go substance identifier and you can type in its name. And you are looking up polychlor, or you were talking, Walt, earlier about polychloral biphenyls. Chlorinated biphenyls, yeah. Yeah, I'll, okay, all right. Chlor chlorinated biphenyls. Usually, when you're doing a search, it's best to keep, keep them singular. Uh, I don't know. And um, yeah, so yeah, so it only came up with one hit, and it's some crazy thing. So well, what that probably means is that I might come up with a more generic search term. Let's come up with something uh, PCB. Yeah, well, okay, we'll see what that. Yeah, that's sort of a generic acronym for it. Oh yeah, there we go. So we got uh, a couple of different things there. So anyway, these are a couple different hits. You can click on this. And it's interesting because you can go down and it shows you all this information about its biological properties, chemical properties, um, yeah, a bunch of physical properties. Here's something that's cool. If you want to see the NMR or the car like the proton or carbon NMR, you can click on these and it'll give it to you. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. They don't have them for every single substance on Earth, but them for a lot of substances, and it's really, really useful. And that's another way you guys can check your homework, by the way. You can use SciFinder Scholar, and if you think that a compound should have this NMR, you can actually look up the compound and find the NMR. Let's go back, though. You might not have a compound that has a particular name. You might just want to draw a structure. You click on Chemical Structure, Click on this and it opens a structure drawing window. And you can draw any molecule you want. Right now we're, I don't really want to draw this molecule. I wonder if I can just copy and paste it in there. Yeah, I don't think it pastes from. <sighs> yeah, 
yeah, for Microsoft Word. But anyway, you can draw this molecule and you can find it that way rather than typing in a name. You can type in molecular formula, but this is the part that I think is really cool. You can type in reaction. Let's say, for example, that I <coughs> want to look up a reaction in which I turn this molecule shown here on the left. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. I want to draw a hydrogen there. I, I want to turn the molecule drawn here to the left into the molecule that's drawn to the right. You draw them both and you put an arrow between them. Reactant product. Now, one thing that I have to point out is that SciFinder will scan these as substructures, which means that if I have a molecule that has an OH anywhere in it that's turned into a product that has a carbon-oxygen double bond anywhere in it, it will give a positive hit. And that might not be at all what I'm looking for, because what I'm looking for is this carbon that's bonded to this oxygen being converted from a single bond to a double bond. Does that make sense? So I might have an OH and a carbon-oxygen double bond in, in my reactant, and I have one in the product, and the reaction is actually doing something totally different from what I'm trying to find. So one way to narrow that down is to click this number tool and call that carbon-1 and that carbon-1. And that tells the software, I want this carbon to be that single bonded oxygen in my reactant to be the same carbon that's double bonded the oxygen in the product. You guys see that okay? Now I do that, I hit okay. You can do a bunch of other uh, search options here. For example, if you want to limit the number of steps, you could say I only want one reaction step. Or you could say one, at one or two. I often click this thing sources other than patents. The reason is because patents sometimes have convoluted experimental procedures that no human can decipher. So it depends on the patent. Anyway, you can do other things. For example, if you want to limit publication years to be more than a decade, or, or like older than a decade, or more recent, or whatever range you want. When you're all done, you hit search. <sighs> Ugh, sorry. And then you sit here and stare at it. Of boredom. Okay, and then we'll look through and see. And you can see that there are 106,000 different reactions that uh, match my search for this particular search. But anyway, you can go down, you can see the conditions. And some of these conditions, these guys use these reagents that have a number here rather than a picture. So if you want to know what is that reagent, you click on it and it will show you the picture, hopefully. So they use this uh, reagent, which is some iridium. Uh, organometallic reagent. That is crazy nuts. <laughs> but anyway, they, they got 100% yield of this, refluxing it for four hours. See, so you can kind of go back down. There's another thing that's useful. Oh, by the way, if you ever want, if you wanted to read the article and its full procedures, you could click uh, the articles. You could click this link and find an abstract, or you can click full text and find the full text, which often includes the procedure. There's something else, though. If you go to sort by, oh, it doesn't let me sort. Hang on. Yeah, it's it's because it's too big. If I have something that has a narrow number of search uh, of hits, I can sort by experiment, and it will actually put from top to bottom only procedures that have experimental detail. You can also refine, um, and you can, you know, remove some things. I only want yields that are. 100% or you know within a certain range stuff like that. Does that make sense? So this is sort of a really useful way of being able to design a synthesis. And succeeding in a synthesis really requires design long before you ever set foot in the lab. Let's not do this. I'm going to see if I can oh. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to take our molecule Borhavia, and I'm going to go to Substance Identifier and find it. And see if anyone's, um, and I'm not including the N7, and the reason is because uh, I'm trying to keep it more generic. Oh, this is interesting. 
Yeah, so this is probably some crazy huge molecule uh, or a molecule they never typed in the structure for. So another option that I can have is I can click, I can draw the molecule structure itself. So I'll go ahead and do that real quick. And often when I'm doing that, I'll try to keep it more generic. So rather than drawing the OHs that are coming off of this ring and this oxygen and these OHs, I'll try to keep it a little bit more generic. I'll have the basic framework, and then I'll leave it at that. And then I'll click substructure search. If I click exact search, then it will search for that exact molecule with no variations. But if I do substructure search, then it will find anything that looks like the molecule that I entered in. <clears throat> and there might be lots of hits. Wow, there's only one substance they found. And it's not the substance that we have reported here. So, so this is interesting. Let's click on this. One thing that's cool about this substance is if you want, well, we'll go and click on it. I think that part of the reason this substance isn't listed is because it's so new. Yeah, it might look very similar to something else. One thing that's kind of cool is, oh gosh, this one doesn't have it. If you click on this thing and go synthesize this or get reactions where substance is a product, you can see if anyone else is synthesized and how they did it. And in reality, well, this compound doesn't have a synthesis reported. So this is another compound where someone found this molecule, or molecule in nature and no one's made it. See so yeah, how this Borhavia might be a little bit more challenging of a structure. Let's let's go to our Vermal Houghton one. That's one of the uh, unique challenges about finding molecules that are so new is that no one has made them and they aren't widely reported. It takes a while between the time a molecule is reported for the first time and um, for it to appear in this database. So this molecule vermal hotten, we can go ahead and click on this thing and go to man, yeah, no one has synthesized this molecule either. Interesting. We can go to get references though and it'll give us a list of all of the references involving this compound. So this is really interesting. This molecule as I've mentioned, I really think I really think we can come up with a good synthesis of it, but I'm I'm surprised to see that no one has. <laughs> so or has synthesized anything like it or identified a compound like it. Let's go back. We'll go to reaction structure. And now I'm going to make my structure even more generic. Okay. Put an oxygen here and an oxygen over here. So see, see, I'm I'm making it even simpler than the one that we have in there. I'm going to hit OK. And I'm going to click search and see if anyone's made anything that looks like this. Uh, yeah, so a few people have. You can kind of see the reaction approaches that they took in order to assemble this thing. See what I'm saying? Sometimes if you can't find the compound using, um, sorry, using substance identifier like we did earlier, go to reaction structure. Because reaction structure will be a little bit more generic because oftentimes there are lots of molecules that are synthesized, but no one actually reports or catalogs the reaction for all of the intermediates along the way. They only catalog like some of the key compounds, either the final product made or some of the key ones that started out. <coughs> anyway, we'll see if uh, anyone's made this thing. Yeah, and this is the same thing. So I want to click on this molecule, and I'm going to go synthesize this. 
and you can see that um, that there are a number of different syntheses of this type of molecule. Now, this molecule itself is not the exact molecule that we're looking for, but you can see that it's similar. So you could sort of, in your brains, imagine what it took to put this thing together. See what I'm saying? And then go back to the starting materials and add the garnish that you need around it in order to put together what we want. That sort of makes sense? Yeah, this is kind of cool. And if you guys ever want to read the, uh, you can click full text to get any of the full text articles and see details regarding this. But this is kind of, this is kind of freaking amazing. So, anyway, that's pretty much it. Do you guys have any questions on the use of SciFine or Scholar? <laughs> I I hope you guys are willing to use this and give it a try. I think it's really really fun. You can use it in the other class too, for like homework problems where you're asked to design a synthesis of something. You can look it up. You can't use it for a crutch because too much because you can't use it on an exam. <laughs> but I think it's a good way to double check stuff and see the way actual chemists assemble things, including illegal narcotics and stuff. <laughs> All right, so that is your assignment. Your assignment is to design a synthesis of either Borhavia N7 or Vermal Houghton. I'll let you pick which one. It is due by February 24th, which is, um, I guess, next month. <laughs> yeah, it's next month sometime. So that's I've given you a while. There, yeah. Anyway, question, Eric. Uh, um, yeah, that's a typo. I need to fix that. Sorry. <laughs> I don't have a synthesis assignment number two, so that is also a typo. So I need to move this over to the 24th. Sorry about that. But anyway, my, my hope is that we can design a synthesis. And after I get all of you guys' submissions, I'll look over all of them and basically combine the steps that look like the most realistic ones that we could actually do. And then we will actually do them during the last four weeks of this class if they're actually doable. Does that make sense? Now, for you students in Price, I don't know if they will be or not. It depends on what stuff you have down there. So we'll see. If not, then I'll come up with some other activities for you during those weeks. Any questions on your assignment? That's pretty much it. You can hand it in on a piece of toilet paper. I don't care as long as I can clearly see what you've got. But you can totally use SciFinder Scholar to do it. And, uh, and go nuts. I hope you guys have a fun time with SciFinder Scholar. It's really, really cool. And it's not just a database used for chemists, although I use it constantly. It's also useful for all kinds of other sciences as well. So biologists, I can see using it if you wanted to look up something about hemoglobin or something about uh, some other protein or something. You could go to Substance Identifier and find, you know, type in the name of that protein and then search it and find literature about that protein. You can also do uh, literature, you can go to Research Topic. You can type in any terms you want. I could say if I want to find out about acne uh, and, you know, buffaloes. Buffalo, buffaloes that have acne, I can type that in. And, and we can see there are actually three references in which the term acne buffalo was found exactly as typed. So I can get those and I can see what in the world. <laughs> One kind of Chinese medicine composition for treating acne, but I don't see the word buffalo anywhere. Buffalo horn. Okay. Well, see, see, that's kind of cool. I mean, you just type in random stuff and, and see what you find. So, anyway, so there you go, guys. Any questions before I let you guys go? You have till February 22nd. Sorry about the syllabus being messed up. I'll uh, fix it. <laughs> All right. If no questions,